Recently, I have been talking a lot about globalist elites and an entrenched ruling class. In fact, I have suggested an alliance between political leaders, the media, corporations, and educational institutions who conspire to push a certain view of the world, a social justice agenda, if you like, at the expense of seemingly everyone else. And as I have become more vocal about this, some people have wondered how I, a staunch classical liberal and individualist, could possibly employ such rhetoric which sounds, at least ostensibly, to be collectivists. In this video, I will explain how an analysis of the ruling class is perfectly in keeping with the classical liberal individualist tradition. First though, it is worth reminding ourselves why the Marxist class analysis of, let's say, the bourgeoisie against the workers or the landowners versus the non-landowners is bunk. It is because it is based on a false premise, namely that society has two abstract statistical categories of collectives of a possessing class who have shared interests and a non-possessing class who also have shared interests which are antagonistic to the first group. Ludwig von Mises provides the doctrinal classical liberal view on this as follows. For the sake of argument, we may admit that man's thoughts must result in doctrines beneficial to his interests, but are a man's interests necessarily identical with those of his old class? Marx himself had to admit that the organisation of the proletarians into a class and consequently into a political party is continually being upset again by the competition between the workers themselves. It is an undeniable fact that there prevails an irreconcilable conflict of interest between those workers who are employed at union wage rates and those who remain unemployed because the enforcement of union rates prevents the demand for and the supply of labour from finding the appropriate price for meeting. And he continues, the first error in this interpretation is that it considers the bourgeoisie as a homogeneous class composed of members whose interests are identical. A businessman is always under the necessity of adjusting the conduct of his business to the institutional conditions of his country. In the long run, he is, in his capacity as an entrepreneur and capitalist, neither favoured nor injured by tariffs or the absence of tariffs. He will turn to the production of those commodities which, under the given state of affairs, he can most profitably produce. Collectivists have no answer to this point. To rebut it, they must invent spurious concepts, such as false consciousness, to explain away workers acting in their own interests, which was later extended to all individuals living under capitalism. And this is true whether you make the groups rich versus poor, or men versus women, or blacks versus whites, or any other collectivist contrivance you care to name. Collectivists also must reckon with another fact that Mises raised. The we cannot act otherwise than each of them acting on his own behalf. They can either all act together in accord, or one of them may act for all of them. Only in this sense does the officer of a social entity act for the whole. The individual members of the collective body either cause or allow a single man's action to concern them too. We have seen all through history how it goes for people who put their trust in a single person to act on their collective behalf. Individual members of a collective might project their own desired preferences onto their ruler and it is this hope that sustains their support. But in the end, only one person will decide, and invariably, they will act in their own interests. So, given this, how is it that I can claim that there is an alliance of vested globalist interests? 
Isn't it the case that individual political leaders, individual media companies, corporations, or uh, educational institutions have competing interests in exactly the same way that I have outlined? Well, yes, but this overlooks the fact that together these four different areas constitute the ruling class today. Many of these massive organizations enjoy state-backed monopolies, which is why they have such a huge vested interest in maintaining the status quo. It is why they hate Donald Trump, Brexit, the Yellow Vests, Salvini, Bolsonaro, even Jeremy Corbyn, and any other force that threatens the current establishment in any way. As I've mentioned before, while I follow the Austrian school in economics, in politics, I follow the Italian school of elitism, Valfredo Pareto, Giantano Mosca, and Robert Michels. In their view, democracy is little more than a sham, replacing the divine right of kings with the divine right of parliament. There is no getting around the fact that in any system, there will be the rulers and the ruled. This is called the iron law of oligarchy. Also, the nature of power is conservative in the strict sense that those in power will seek to stay in power and maintain the conditions that keep them in power. Think of the leadership of the Soviet Union, for example, whose first priority before any ideological commitment to communism was their own survival. To paraphrase Mikhail's further, there is no such thing as a revolutionary government. This is even true within organizations. Indeed, Michels pointed out many instances in which union leaders supported policies which enhanced their own position against the will of the membership, who were often a lot less left-leaning in their views than their leaders. In fact, many union policies in history were pushed through despite the views of the membership. Now, classical liberals throughout history have been realists. They all accept this fact of the rulers and the ruled as a given. Here's Mill, for example, who says there are two classes. The first class, those who plunder, are the small number. They are the ruling few. The second class, who are plundered, are the great number. They are the subject many. Or here is uh, von Mises again. He says, Liberalism realizes that the rulers, who are always a minority, cannot lastingly remain in office if not supported by the consent of the majority of those ruled. Whatever the system of government may be, the foundation upon which it is built and rests is always the opinion of those ruled that to obey and be loyal to this government better serves their own interests than insurrection and the establishment of another regime. The majority has the power to do away with an unpopular government and uses this power whenever it becomes convinced that its own welfare requires it. In the long run, there is no such thing as an unpopular government. So what has happened in our current situation is that those who plunder, that is the people who forcibly extract resources through force and coercion, otherwise known as the government, have, through various regulations, allowed themselves to be lobbied by corporations, including media corporations, so that their mutual survival depends on this two-way relationship. CNN, Procter & Gamble, and let's say the US Democrat Party, could not survive if the network of laws which protect them from open competition were ever removed. The education system, which was once fairly independent from all of this, is now entirely enthralled to the vested interests of corporations and of the government. They depend very heavily on the maintenance of this system for their income, whether directly from the government or indirectly through the continued employment of woke graduates by woke corporations. Individuals may join the ruling class or they may leave it or they may jostle for position within it, but the fact remains that they are a class in the truest sense. This, in fact, is the only sense in which there is a genuine class struggle, the struggle between the elites 
and the people. Of course, most normal people, people who make their own living in small businesses, people who are just workers going about their everyday life, are cut out of the elite world entirely. Their only role is to consume the complete horseshit that these people serve them up on a daily basis. And woe betide those who dare to complain about the quality of the bread and circuses. I have said on numerous occasions before that I think that this current ruling class is on the way out. But that could take a very long time. It will start with the politicians because this is the area over which theoretically we have direct control with our votes. But the next and bigger challenge will be the media and the corporations. Again, we have direct control over our remote controls and our wallets, but such is their accumulated power that it might take a lot of chip damage to take them down or to replace them with a different set of companies who concentrate only on making the best products or on accurately reporting the day's news. Educational establishments naturally risk total irrelevance in time, but these too will need reform, and I suspect there will be some free market challenge at some point to the current situation in the current years. A ruling class will not dismantle itself. Its incentives are to cling on for dear life. We must do all we can to bring them down. Of course, you cannot destroy the elites entirely. You can only replace them. Our aim must be to drive a wedge between the four-way alliance as it currently stands and to weaken the current elites to the point where they have lost genuine influence and power. Now get out. And a very special thanks to Sir Percy Blakeney, the Crimson Satyr, the Ambivalent Onion, Andy Swainson, Bailey Inarora, David Vacherche, Christopher Scholholm, Natural Rights, Binary Surfer, Holy Spatula, Hornito Jones, Kazga, Michael Tynan, Time Stealer, Toyo Tommy Ami, Tragic Vision, William Angus, Blake Barrows, and Edward Darrow.